Hey everybody and welcome to our Does God Exist project where we're producing a series of videos that make the cumulative case for the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus. If you enjoyed today's video, consider subscribing. If you want to help me make more of these videos, you can visit the Patreon link in the video description. Also, make sure that you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. Let's get started. Yeah. In Dostoevsky's book, Crime and Punishment, he has a, his main character, uh, Raskolnikov, decides that he's going to commit a murder, and he has very good justification for the murder, and Dostoevsky is very good at this. He, he puts his characters into very, very difficult moral situations and gives them full justification for pursuing the, the, uh, pursuing the pathway that they're pursuing. And so Raskolnikov, he's broke and starving. He wants to go to law school. His sister's about to prostitute herself, rough, roughly speaking, by marrying a guy that, that hates her, that she hates, and, that, and he has contempt for her, or at least acts in that manner. He's trying to rescue his mother as well, who's also in dire financial straits. He, he, he goes to a pawnbroker to pawn his meager position so that he can continue to scrape by. And she has this niece, I believe it's her niece, that's not very bright, who she basically treats as, an, as a slave and is horrible to. And, and so the, 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 the pawnbroker has this money. Raskolnikov is in dire need. He thinks, look, I'll just kill her, because why the hell not? I'll take her money. She's not doing any good with it anyways. I'll free her niece, who's just lurking as a slave. She's got all these other people tangled up in her pawnbroker schemes. All that'll happen is the world will be a better place. And the only thing that's holding me back is conventional moral cowardice. And, you know, Dostoevsky has his character in Crime and Punishment go through days, hours, hours and days and weeks of intense imagination about this, rationalization about this, trying to justify himself, placing, him outside, placing himself outside the law so that he can perpetrate this act, and telling himself with all the best nihilistic arguments that the only possible thing that could be holding him back is an, an arbitrary sense of indoctrinated morality. And so Dostoevsky explores that. He does commit the murder, and then, of course, all hell breaks loose because things don't necessarily turn out the way that you want. He gets away with it, however. Well, he gets away with it technically because no one knows he did it but he doesn't get away with it in relationship to his own conscience. And so that the rest of the book explores that. Well, Dostoevsky, I believe it was in Crime and Punishment, although he makes the same point in many of his books, he makes a very fundamental point. And this is the kind of point that, that I think that people who haven't investigated these matters down this particularly lit, particular literary and philosophical pathway never grapple with. Dostoevsky said straightforwardly, if there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. And that's the th question that he's investigating. And you see, this is why I have such frustration, say, with people like Sam Harris, the sort of radical atheists, because they seem to think that once human beings abandon their, their grounding in the transcendent, that the, the plausible way forward is with a kind of purest rationality that automatically attributes to other people equivalent value. It's like, I just don't understand that. They, they, they believe that that's the rational pathway. What the hell is irrational about me getting exactly what I want from every one of you whenever I want it at every possible second? Why is that uh, irrational? And how possibly is that more irrational than us cooperating so we can both have a good time of it? I don't understand that. I mean, it's as if the, the psychopathic tendency is irrational. There's nothing irrational about it. It's pure naked self-interest. How is that irrational? I don't understand that. Where, where's the pathway from rationality to, to an egalitarian virtue? Why the hell not every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost? It's a perfectly coherent philosophy. And it's actually one that you can institute in the world with a fair bit of material success if you want to do it. So, I don't, un see, to me, I think that, that the universe that people like Dawkins and Harris 
inhabit is so intensely conditioned by mythological presuppositions that they take for granted the, the ethic that emerges out of that as if it's just a given, a rational given. And this, of course, precisely do, not Nietzsche's observation as well as Dostoevsky's. That's Nietzsche's observation. You don't get it. The ethic that you think is normative is a consequence of its, of, its, of its nesting inside this tremendously lengthy history, much of which was expressed in mythological formulation. You wipe that out. You don't get to keep all the presuppositions and just assume that they're rationally axiomatic. They're, the rational, to make a rational argument, you have to start with an in, initial proposition. Well, the proposition that underlies Western culture is that there's a transcendent morality. Today we'll be talking about how the existence of objective morality points to the existence of God. By objective morality, we mean a morality that is not based upon personal opinions, but rather upon a transcendent revelation about the true nature of morality itself. Here's the moral argument for the existence of God. 1. Truly objective morals cannot exist without a perfect source. 2. Objective morals do exist. 3. Therefore, a perfect source must exist. If there is no God, then it follows that there is no objective morality. But this would not comport with reality. The following test helps us to understand the reality of objective morals better. Here's the question. Can murder and love be considered morally equal on the moral spectrum? That is, is it reasonable to believe that love and murder could both be good? Of course not. Murder is objectively bad and love is objectively good. Rational people always answer that murder and love cannot possibly be considered moral equals, otherwise the words would have no meaning at all. They are essentially opposite on the moral spectrum. This leads to an additional question though. Is love good and murder bad despite the cultural opinion, time of history, or place in the universe? Again, rational people recognize that the difference between murder and love on the moral spectrum doesn't change due to people, places, or historical periods. That is, murder is bad and love is good during all time periods, in all places, for all people, irrespective of personal opinion. The alternative to this conclusion would be to say that love and murder can potentially be moral equals depending on external variables, which is absurd and unreasonable. It's important to remember that absurdity and rationality don't go together. It's true that a person could claim that love and murder could be moral equals, however, they could not also claim to be taking a rational stance on this issue. If someone's stance on an issue leads to absurdity and therefore irrationality, then we can safely remove their conclusion from the realm of reasonable options. Now, since objective morals do exist, as we've concluded, then God must also exist. In other words, if moral laws exist, then it follows that a moral lawgiver exists. Otherwise, we are left to argue that moral laws came from nothing and therefore they have at bottom no moral value in the first place. This is another absurd conclusion that does not match the reality of love and murder being just absolutely different on the moral spectrum. Since we can establish that a moral lawgiver does exist, it's important to note the necessary nature that such a lawgiver must have in order to provide truly objectively moral laws. Number one, he must be all-knowing, or there may be morals that he doesn't know about. Number two, he must be ever-present, or there may exist better morals in some place that he hasn't been. Number three, he must be all-loving, otherwise his morals would be inherently corrupt. Or number four, he must be all-powerful, or otherwise his morals would never be capable of full implementation. These divine attributes match the traditional definition of God. Therefore, since objective morality does exist, God also exists. Since God exists and he has certain moral preconditions for us, then it follows that ultimate purpose and meaning also exist. Our ultimate purpose and meaning is to grow in our embodiment of God's moral standards through His power. The moral argument for the existence of God is one of multiple powerful reasons to believe God exists, 
which we will be covering in additional episodes. Thank you for watching today's episode of Does God Exist? If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing. If you want to help me make more of these videos, you can visit the Patreon link in the video description. Also, make sure you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. We'll see you next time.